Hey, Neurofeedback Moms. I am Miriam Bellamy. I am the mom who started this group. I am an LMFT, and I am the director of Whole Family Neurofeedback. Uh, one of the benefits, as many of you know, of being a part of this group is that we offer um, uh, access to speakers, writers um, who know about and who are experts in issues that you care about. Um, in addition to all the information about neurofeedback. So today uh, I have with me Debbie Reber, who is the author of many books. But before I introduce her, I wanted to just make sure as you're listening, please feel free to uh, put your questions in the comments. Uh, I will be monitoring that and uh, Debbie's happy to take those questions live as they come in. Um, and there you go. So Debbie uh, is an author of many books. Uh, her most recent book is called Differently Wired. Uh, she is a parenting activist, uh, best-selling author, keynote speaker, and the founder of what she calls Tilt Parenting, which we're going to learn about. Um, let's see. Uh, Differently Wired is the subtitle is A Parent's Guide to Raising an Atypical Child with Confidence and Hope. And that came out in June 2018. She lived in the Netherlands, which is interesting, for five years. Uh, and she and her husband and 17-year-old son moved back to Brooklyn. And uh, they've been there since 2019. So for you East Coasters, <laughs> y'all are on the same time. I know it's 6 o'clock. It's just 4 o'clock out here in Colorado. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks so much, Miriam. I'm happy to be here. So uh, in sort of me talking about this uh, interview that we were going to do, we, we were talking about twice exceptional children. What is that? And how did you get started doing this work? Yeah, so twice exceptionality is, it's actually a phrase that I first discovered when I heard it used in reference to my child when they were about five. What it is, is when someone is gifted, you know, sometimes that means a high IQ, it could be gifted in other ways, but gifted and there is some sort of neurodevelopmental difference. So a learning disability, um, often a child who would be gifted and autistic, gifted ADHD, gifted dyslexia. And it's it's also known as 2E sometimes, so just the number two and the, and the letter E, you'll see it that way. But it's really tricky because it's hard to identify. For, for and reasons I can go into. But I got into this work because I discovered I was raising a twice exceptional kid. It was when I heard the phrase, it really just resonated. And I'm like, okay, that explains a lot. And it's a really complicated profile because these, you know, I call these kids kind of tricky because they're so asynchronous in the way that they learn and their gifts sometimes mask their you know, challenges and vice versa. What do you mean by asynchronous in the way that they learn? Yeah, so asynchronous development is such a hallmark of, well, gifted kids too, but especially twice exceptional. So you may have a child who at the age of six is reading, you know, philosophy or might be able to explain to the theory of relativity socially and emotionally, they may be operating at the level of a three-year-old. Um, so you ha you can often have these vast disconnects between their cognitive development and their social emotional development. And that disconnect, like the gap there is so pronounced. And that is actually what creates so many challenges, you know, because these can be misunderstood. Uh, and you might I often would think I was talking with a peer when Asher was like, 10 because we could have these really in deep in-depth conversations yet socially and emotionally um the something that i would think would be something really small could completely dysregulate him so yeah it's complicated so what makes them hard to identify yeah so first of all think about a kid maybe who has dyslexia um, dyslexia by itself is often undiagnosed is, you know, all kids are not necessarily screened for learning disabilities. And so if a child isn't performing, you know, with their reading, or maybe they're really struggling with their math facts. And so we might not think, oh, dyscalculia, you know, we'll think this child is maybe not as bright, or, you know, they have challenges. And so 
they often, these kids can get kind of held back. They're given remediation to focus on these things. We're not diagnosing the learning disability. Meanwhile, they've got a brain that can do so much if they are, you know, able to learn the way that their brain is wired to learn. And so oftentimes the learning disability just masks the giftedness. And then these kids, you know, they're so, I've heard from so many adults who were <clears throat> in special ed, um, who were held back, who, and who kind of internally knew, like, I don't belong here. Like, I know that I'm really smart, uh, but because of the way that our educational system, at least in the U.S., is structured, oftentimes those gifts are just not recognized. So, um, and then I'm also sort of wondering, too, because when you and I first spoke, I started thinking, huh, I wonder if one of mine <laughs> sort of fits in this. And one of the ways I think we missed her diagnosis for so long is because she was so smart. And I think she developed strategies that it she got through just fine. <laughs> yes. I mean, yes. I think it was that a struggle the... for her, but still, yeah. go ahead. Sorry. No, that's exactly it. That's the flip side. So these kids can be really, you know, uh, adaptable and they can hack themselves. They can overcompensate and figure out their own systems. And we may not know that they're struggling at all. They may be wondering, why is this so much harder for me than everybody else? So they may internalize there's something wrong with me, okay. right? Um, and so often these kids can mask or hide their learning disabilities sometimes until they're, you know, middle school, high school, um, mm -hmm. or beyond. Mm -hmm. And and then it's like, oh my gosh, there's a reason why this has been so hard for me. But yeah, so that's really complicated because a lot of these mm -hmm. kids are able to find ways around their relative challenges. And I'm thinking too, there, there are ways that it's not going to be picked up because of like standardized testing right? Because mm -hmm. these kids might not necessarily do very well on that kind of testing, right? Even though that intelligence yeah, is absolutely. there, that testing. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, yeah. I mean, I'll just say processing speed is something we often see uh, in okay. twice exceptional kids or just gifted kids. We often see kids might have a big disconnect between their intellect, you know, in terms of the way they can uh, process information or recognize patterns, but then processing speed, getting thoughts out in a way that, you know, that we've deemed mm -hmm. a, a, as a whole is the way to demonstrate knowledge. Um, there's a disconnect there. It's like things get backed up in a big dam. So writing mm -hmm. can be really difficult. And so essay tests can be a crash and burn scenario for these kids. Or yeah, many kids who have learning disabilities they need extra time on tests, but if they haven't been diagnosed, they're not going to get those accommodations and therefore they perform terribly on these standardized tests that are, you know, there's do these number of questions and in, in this amount of time, you know, filling in the bubbles can be really difficult for a lot of kids because of distraction. So yeah, unfortunately, the way that a lot of our school systems are set up, they they work for a pretty narrow, I think, um, they're, they're just fine for a pretty narrow uh, population of students or students can kind of make their way. But there are so many kids who don't thrive with that, okay. you know, modality of demonstrating their mastery or their knowledge about any subject. Yeah. So now I'm wondering, is it genetic? Well, <laughs> I do not think the apple falls far from the tree. I mean, I mean, how many books have you written? <laughs> I don't know if there's any other diagnosis there, but <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's really interesting. You know, in in my community, so many parents are discovering their own neurodivergence yes. as a result of going through this process of really understanding who their kids are. Um, I've never been formally diagnosed with, you know what I now know is my own ADHD, um, it, you know, but so many pieces have come together. I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh, like, and it's taken me a while to even figure yeah. that out. So uh, yes, there is very often a, a genetic component and it's really fascinating to see this entire like generation of people in their thirties, forties and fifties, like discovering, oh my gosh, I'm on the spectrum or, oh my gosh, I have, overcompensated for this learning disability my whole life. Yeah. 
So I had Dr. Do you know Dr. Ned Hallowell? Oh yes, he's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> he he was on a couple of months ago and as we were talking backstage, I was saying, Yeah, both my daughters have this diagnosis, blah blah. He said, So you have ADHD? And I said, What? No. And I, I listed off my accomplishments. He's like, the most underdiagnosed group for ADHD are high achieving women. Yeah. <laughs> and so he said, let's so end five, different. 10 minutes early. We'll spend some time. I'll let you know. And at the, it was like, yeah, you're ADHD. So I just got my diagnosis yeah. a couple months ago and it made so oh. many things make sense. It just like, yeah, yeah. because it, it's a struggle. There's a lot of work that goes into all my, <laughs> all that I do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, I, you know, I, I am so good at systems now. So mm. people come to me to help organize projects. And so, uh, you know, on paper, I have executive functioning skills, like <laughs> nobody's business. But I now recognize that, 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 you know, I didn't develop those till my late 20s. And I had okay. to develop my own yeah. systems because, uh, because I couldn't cope. I was a terrible student in, in yeah. high school and undergrad. So yeah. And for many of us, maybe when we have children, it really pushes all those things that we could sort of get by with, you know, and then the kids mm -hmm. come along and it's this whole other world. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Will you tell us some more about your Tilt community? Why why Tilt? How'd you come up with that name? What does it mean? Well, I just to say up front, it's not an acronym. I get asked that all the time. Okay. And I can tell you the, the story as quickly as possible. So before we moved abroad, you mentioned we moved to the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. We were just struggling so much as a family and mm -hmm. we decided to throw all the rules out the window and homeschool and like make this major life change. And we went to the Jersey shore right before the move. And Asher and I rode on the tilt a whirl, you know, that ride in an amusement park and it kind of whips you around. You're kind of seated and you never know when the next, you know, turn's going to happen. And, my husband captured a photo of us kind of mid whirl and we're holding on for dear life and our hair is flying back and we've got these huge grins on our face. And I posted that picture on my wall. To me, it just captured so much mm. of what we were doing. We were just holding on. We were, we, we never knew what was going to happen next. And we we're kind of throwing everything upside down. And so this word tilt, wow. when I eventually created the community, it just represented so much. But really, you know, the way I use it now is, is also that we need to tilt our, our ideas about what it means to, you know, to educate, what it means to parent. We need to always be tilting our perspective to really be able to show up for who these kids are and mm -hmm. kind of get off this path that we thought we were on and really open up to the path we actually are on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I sort of have this image. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, that's if, kind of what it's like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So um, with these kiddos, you have developed strategies. You've had done a lot of thinking and I know you have a lot of experience with how to support these kids. So if someone's listening and they're like, huh, I wonder if that's one of my kids or more than one of my kids or me talking about the kids, how do we, how do we support them? Where would a person start? Well, I think because these kids, especially these two E twice exceptional kids, they do have so many incredible strengths. I think that that's where we want to start is by really getting curious about their strengths. Because so often when we recognize our kids are not doing well, they're not thriving in this area or that area, that's where we put all of our resources. And we often ignore the gifts. And not that we don't want to support and work on areas of, you know, relative weakness i think that's important but we can do so much when we kind of go all in on the strengths and those deep areas of interest and and really lean in and use those as a foundation for all of the other things for the executive function for the planning and organizing and um and building confidence so i think really that's where you want to start is just maybe kind of put the brakes on and make sure like take a look at where you're spending your energy if you're doing therapies what what are you spending your money on and make sure that you are promoting and developing the strengths as much mm -hmm. if not more than the areas of challenge mm -hmm. and how do you involve the kids in that i know you have some some thoughts on talking to these kids and letting them know mm -hmm. 
about their differently wired brains? How do we, how do you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I think we, first of all, we want to normalize difference. I think we as adults often ha have a lot of ideas about what it means to have this label. I hear from parents all the time, I don't want my kid to have this label that's going to hurt their self-esteem. And we know from talking with adults who discover their neural divergence, how much that label has empowered them mm -hmm. to be able to really kind of step into who they are and make sense of their experience. So I think normalizing difference is something we want to do from day one mm -hmm. and talk about these things at the dinner table, talk about the things that we're all working on, explore this from a brain science perspective. I think, especially with two E kids, they're curious, like they like to learn about things. And so I think we want to be, it's, it's not like one conversation. It's, it's kind of like a culture that we have in our families that we are, we, we care about self knowledge. We care about self discovery. We care about understanding what we need to thrive in the world. And we, as parents model that in ourselves, we model our own struggles and how we hack ourselves. And we just talk openly about, we use the words, we use the labels and we help our kids kind of lean into their own identity without feeling like there's something wrong with them or they're broken. So it's not easy to do because again, I think we live in a society where there is stigma and I feel like it's getting better. More and more people, high profile people are talking openly about their mental health or their uh, neural divergence, but we have a long way to go. And so I think it's really important for us to first of all, recognize if we are holding on to some kind of unhealthy beliefs about what it means to have this or that label associated with our kids, kind of do mm -hmm. our work around that mm -hmm. um, and really make sure that we're, we're just always talking about these things. Matter of fact, strengths-based, isn't this interesting? Like, mm -hmm. that's so interesting. I bet this is why <laughs> you think that way. And that is mm. pretty cool because I would never have approached that problem that way. So we can just mm -hmm. always be talking about things with our kids from, from that lens. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's a, some importance in the label too, like twice exceptional. Sounds kind of good. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and how, yes. how inaccurate ADHD is, the, 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 the label, the title. I mean, the ability yeah. to hyper-focus is huge. The strengths mm -hmm. there are, are significant. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why I really kind of anchored in with this phrase differently wired when I launched Tilt Parenting, because so much of the language surrounding neurodivergence is pathologized, it's disorder based. It's, you know, I, I, I shared this story in the book where I was having a picnic with Asher. I think Asher was maybe 10. And I said, Oh, I read this study about, you know, during pregnancy, if a woman does this, the risks of the child being autistic and Asher stopped me at 10 was like, what do you mean the risks? Is autism a disease? And I was like, oh no, you're right. Thank you. Thank you for wow. calling me on that. That's what the, yeah. you know, um, so I was like, I think chances would have been a better word. The chances of having an autistic okay. child. Um, yeah. So it's just such a part of our culture to use the word epidemic of this and that. And um, so, Yes. So I think we have a, there, there's a lot of challenges with labels in general, and there is a lot more neural diversity affirming language that's coming up. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's just becoming more part of the lexicon and that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the more we can be also uh, dynamically focused. So I'm a Bowen family systems therapist. And so it's, it's the most non-pathologizing theory of human behavior that's out there in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and we think about things as in motion always. And so when you think about it like that, it's not this problem that's chiseled in stone. Yes, we have brain wiring. It's real. <laughs> mm -hmm. It can be very mm -hmm. challenging. But the, when you think about it dynamically and, and in the context of a relationship, I, I just think there's so much hope in thinking about it like that. So yes, the labeling and, and talking about it in a way that is a process oriented. So anyway, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, Say a little bit about uh, the Differently Wired book. I know we're going to be talking in just a minute about a book, free book club that you're offering about the book. But what, why would somebody, what would somebody get out of uh, reading this book? Yeah, when I wrote the book, I 
in part wanted it to be a manifesto because I really believe so deeply and when I launched Tilt Parenting, this was a core foundation for it, is that we need to shift the whole paradigm. We need to change the way these kids experience the world, the way that they're respected and supported and seen mm -hmm. in schools and just kind of in the world. And so the, the first chunk of Differently Wired is really a manifesto. I really spent a lot of time looking at what I think systemically is, is broken and okay. what the cost of that is for all of us, not just for our kids and our families like mine, but for all of us, we need these disruptor, you know, these disruptors to mm. fix the world. <laughs> so, so it's part manifesto and the majority of the book is team of these, what I call, and they are reframes. They are things that not that your kid can do or try this strategy with your kid, but rather what can we do? How can we, we reframe our thinking? How can we um, change our experience in this or that area so that we can show up with, again, respect, with confidence, so we can really find more peace in this? So many parents, I find, and I was this parent, we find out there's a problem and we go into fix it mode. We want solutions, we want a plan, we want to, you know, get back on the path that we wanted to be on. And so that's a lot of energy and it doesn't really support anybody. It just feels frustrating and it, it doesn't really kind of ultimately help our kids grow up to be these self-actualized adults um, that we want for them. So, um, so this is the rest of the book is really about how to find acceptance with what's going on, how to lean into uh, who your child is, how to throw out these arbitrary timelines and start kind of recognizing every child is on their unique path, mm. how to find your people and stop caring about what other people think. So it's really touching on the parent's emotional journey so that we can just be show up for these kids in a much better way. So um, it sounds like a pretty significant reframe in there is these kids can are here to change the world. Can you say something about that, that we yeah. need them to change the world? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did it um, right before I moved back from Amsterdam. I got to speak at TEDx Amsterdam, and that was the focus of my talk is I do believe, you know, I, I had the kid who was highly disruptive and, you know, notes home and um, st starting a side business in second grade that kind of got the whole class and factions and, um, you know, like, interesting, fascinating, you know, kids. And when they're younger, there's such a priority on compliance and, uh, you know, not asking questions, but doing as you're told and not coloring outside the lines. Yet, as a culture, we celebrate adults who are innovators, who are disrupting, you know, mm -hmm. industries, right, who are coming up with those incredible creative solutions. Well, our differently wired kids are those people. And so we need them to grow up and launch feeling good about who they are. We need them to understand what their gifts are so that they can share them with the rest of us. And so many of these kids, they don't, you know, they don't make it. To, to feel that way. They've, they experience trauma in schools, you know, they, they get bullied, they just really struggle. If, if we're, if parents don't have the resources, or, you know, wherever this child is, they, they get that message reinforced every day that you're broken, that you're mm -hmm. not smart, there's something mm -hmm. wrong with you. Mm -hmm. And so there is a lot at stake. Mm -hmm. You bet. Being disruptors. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we need them. Yeah. Uh, so talk to us about the free uh, book club that's coming up. Yeah, so I have, uh, when I first came out with Differently Wired, which was, gosh, almost four years ago, I ran a book club two times where I just met live over four weeks um, over Zoom to just go through the book. I created a workbook to go along with it so that parents can really work through how do how do I actually apply this to my own life? And I haven't done it in a couple of years. And I just, uh, I've had a lot of new listeners on my podcast. And I thought, I want to do this again. I really love it's my favorite thing is to just uh, connect with mm. other parents and get into it, like get into mm. it all and, and help parents 
realize that you can feel so much better in this. You did not draw the short straw. Your kid is amazing. You're the mm -hmm. exact parent that they need. Mm -hmm. And so getting to support parents in that way is just incredible. So yeah, so I'm offering this uh, book club again. It starts at the end of April and it's free. The, the cost of entry is my book. Is purchasing the book, I think. Your video went out just for a little bit there. Yeah. Okay. So oh, yeah. Yes. Book. It's just having the book. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. <clears throat> let's see. So, so like I wish I had found neurofeedback a very long time ago. I wish I had found your your thinking on this uh, a long time ago, too. Um, so I'll put a link in the comments about uh, the Facebook group or the the book club, but you also have a Facebook group that I joined um, that's very active, tons of resources, lots of parents in there posting about resources they found and, and getting help and so forth. What's the name of that Facebook community so I can, um, what's the name of it so people can hear yeah. and then I can put it in the comments too. Yeah, it's called Tilt Together and it's really I mean, I hang out in there, but it's really driven by the community. It's a place to get anything from a recommendation for an occupational therapist in Missoula, or I have an IEP meeting tomorrow, what should I be asking for, or um, very specific challenges. Mm -hmm. And there's always a ton of parents who know exactly what that parent is going through and can kind of mentor them through this situation. Yeah, yeah. we try to do that in this group too, so... Thank you, Debbie, for uh, being with us today. And um, I hope that some of the moms here who've been listening can, can take advantage of some of these resources. Thank you, Miriam. All right. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next time.